photographer and online editor for Dublog and the Rivet Press, but um, I'm actually not going to talk about any of that. Um, I'm going to talk about something really personal. Um, it's going to be hard for me to talk about. It might be hard to listen to. Um, but I do believe we should do things that scare the shit out of us from time to time. This is uh, definitely one of those. Um, so I was a regular teenager, 15-year-old, um, moody, fairly cantankerous, uh, bossy, um, studying my GCSEs, really, really active. Uh, I'm one of life's fidgets. If I'm moving, I'm happy. That's, that's basically me. Um, and things started to go wrong progressively. Um, physically, I started getting a lot weaker. I started having memory lapses. Um, it's systematic and my body just seemed to be working against me. Got through my exams, just about. Um, got through the summer, started my coursework for A-levels. I was all on track. But I kept getting sicker. Um, my immune system was gone. Um, I caught everything, absolutely everything that went around. And then one day my legs went from underneath me. I was standing and then I wasn't, flat on the floor. Um, that wasn't the, wasn't the scariest time. It wasn't even the second time that happened that was the scariest time, or the third. It was the time that I couldn't get back up. It wasn't strong enough to get back up. And from that first fall, within two months, I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk, I couldn't stand. And then systematically, I couldn't sit up, I couldn't move my arms, I couldn't feed myself, I couldn't swallow. Um, and the worst part is, no one could tell me why. Um, I went to various doctors, GP to GP. I had growing pains, apparently. Um, it was a physical manifestation of childhood issues. Um, it was stress coming out in a different way. Uh, they didn't have a Scooby, basically. Blood tests, blood tests, blood tests, scans of every possible variety, every corner of the hospital. You can imagine I've been in it. Um, and they just, they just didn't know. It was actually a friend who'd had the illness for a long, long time who saw me getting piggybacked out of the car because at this point I couldn't, couldn't get myself around. And she took one look at me, heard about my symptoms and said, you need to speak to someone about an illness called ME. What the hell is ME? So it's taken me a while to figure this out because basically no one really knows. Um, I remember I asked to see an ME specialist and I was sent to a neurologist because at the time ME was considered a mental illness. Um, and he flicked a light in my eyes and went, there's nothing wrong with your brain. Fantastic, what's wrong with my legs? Um, and from then, he did a couple of, couple of blood tests and uh, said, yeah, you've probably got ME. And um, from that point, I haven't really liked using it. A lot of, lot of prejudice comes with ME. So I've avoided saying to people, I have, what's wrong with you? I have ME. I prefer to use chronic fatigue. It's a, it's a sort of a newer name for it and there's not the same amount of misconceptions that come along with it. Um, but I want to take that back today. I have ME and there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in this illness at all. So this is, this is basically the ME jargon. We've got what makes it up is chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. Chronic fatigue is more the, the tiredness. And fibromyalgia is the pain. So I want to ask you to do me a favor if you could all close your eyes. And I'm gathering a lot of us are, are quite active. So if you can imagine the last run or cycle or swim where you've pushed yourself past your comfort zone and you felt that burn, that really intense burn in your legs and your arms, the point where you're going to collapse because that burn is really intense. It's got you. You can't go any further. 
I want you to times that by about 10. And I want you to mentally scout out the muscles in your body. So my first thought is my legs. They get you about, they're quite important. And your arms, for lifting stuff. But for feeding yourself and writing. And then what about your back that lets you sit up and turn? And the muscles between your ribs that let you lift up in and out so you can breathe. Or the muscles in your face that let you smile and speak. And your tongue that lets you chew and form your words. Or the muscles in your esophagus that let you swallow. Or the muscles in your fingers and your toes. From the top of your head to the bones in your feet, I want you to put that burn, that really, really intense burn. That is what chronic fatigue is. That's what ME is. Fibromyalgia is as if the major bones in your body are being grated by a cheese grater. It's the only way I can explain it. A hammer's being taken to your joints. All these different types of pain fused constantly, incessantly, with no end point in sight. So you can open your eyes now. I can tell you what ME is, but I can show you what ME is. And I hate these photos and I love these photos because I made myself take them. Zimmer frames and wheelchairs. That first one, I couldn't hold my own neck up. That's why big blood tests, blood tests, blood tests. This was my view, this was my life for about two, three years with my own toes. Painkillers, hospitals, that's the view out my window. I was housebound for a long time, bedbound for a long time. So, this, I mean, that is a really, really difficult for me to look at because looking back now, it sort of feels like a twisted nightmare, a life that wasn't quite mine. Um, it was a really difficult part of my life, but it's also the part of my life where I learned the most about myself and other people and our capacity to endure and survive and recover. Um, so I want to share some of these lessons with you. The first one is prejudice is ignorance in a more obnoxious outfit. Um, there's a tipping point as soon as you're diagnosed with ME. It's a gift and it's a curse because you've been fighting for an answer for so long that you're grateful. You're grateful for a diagnosis. And it sort of feels like a vindication. But it also comes along with all this, a lot of prejudice and a lot of ignorance and a lot of misconceptions. And prejudice and ignorance, they come from the same place. It's a fundamental lack of understanding. Except ignorance knows, it doesn't know what it's saying, so it asks. Prejudice knows it doesn't have a clue and continues to talk shit anyway. And um, so today, what my aim is, is for no one to leave this barn ignorant or prejudiced. And so I want to debunk some of these misconceptions. I'm so shaking, I'm so scared. Emmy is about sleep. You're just lazy. I've heard this a lot. And a raise a hand who thinks the main symptom of Emmy is sleep. Hey. Um, actually, one of the most common parts of Emmy is insomnia. Um, I'm a really bad sleeper. I sleep for about an hour and a half at a time. And then I wake up. It takes me about 45 minutes to get back to sleep. I sleep for an hour and a half again. And what this means is you're not slipping into the REM stage of sleep, which is when all the restorative hormones are released. And so your body knows it's broken, and it's desperately trying to fix it. So it keeps plunging you really viciously into this sleep that you're getting nothing from. So it's just constantly over and over again, trying to get you to be better, but you can't. So that's where the sleep comes from. It's a constantly vicious cycle. My main symptom um, was actually pain. Um, 
I took a lot, I took a lot of painkillers. Um, I took 25 tablets a day, really, really strong painkillers. I worked that out to be 9,125 a year, and over the eight years I've had ME, that's nearly 80,000 painkillers. And that's, that's not even including morphine, which I had a ginormous bottle of in my cupboard um, for when it got really, really bad. Sleep is, is just the tip of the iceberg for Emmy. Emmy is an easy MS. I remember seeing um, a comedy sketch and it was infuriating because it, it's like comparing asthma to Alzheimer's because they have a couple of the same letters in. Um, it's just, it's just not, they're, not the same, they're not the same illness. And this, this is Lynn. And I bring up this case because it was on a Channel 4 dispatches. It got quite a lot of press. Um, because our mum was charged with assisted suicide. Um, from 14, just like me, she had a very, very active lifestyle, and then bam. Um, she couldn't move anything from the waist down. The only difference was she stayed like that for 17 years. Um, she was fed through a tube. She was constantly on morphine. And in the end, she, she, she couldn't deal with it, and her mum helped her. Um, and I show this not to bum everyone out, but because... I want people to see that it's very serious. You know, people can recover from this. I've recovered from this, and I want everyone to know, especially people with me, that you can get over this. But you also need to know that a lot of people feel like this, that there's no end. And that's, that's, that's not right. And um, Emmy isn't terminal. It's not like MS. It's not a degenerative illness, but it can take your life in every other conceivable way. Uh, my life was, was gone. Every, just that when you're on the cusp of figuring out what everything is, you sort of got your hands on it, and then, then suddenly, it's, where the fuck did that go? Uh, Emmy can be cured by rest. I mean, in, in the beginning, I was, I was still at school, and a lot of my teachers said, take two weeks off, get plenty of rest, you'll come back right as rain. Does, it doesn't work. I wish I, wish I could say that. Um, too much of anything with ME is a bad, bad thing. Too much rest, too much exertion. They're, they're, it's both as bad as each other. Um, to get over it, you have to work hard. You have to fight hard. And it will be these tiny increments that you've got to doggedly pursue. And you've got to keep, keep going and keep going and keep going for these tiny little things until one day they all piece together. And you look back and you think, wow. Second one is allow people their coping mechanisms. I think it's funny that as beings, we're all biologically the same. We're all made out of the same bones and tissue and marrow. But emotionally, we function on planes far removed from each other. No two of us are really the same. And no people deal with the situation the same. And going through this, one of the most important things was that I wasn't the only one going through it. Um, my family and the people that love me were watching me fall apart, and it killed them. And how they reacted was not how I would react. And as a 16-year-old, it's very confusing, because it can feel hurtful. Why, why, are they, why are they reacting like that? You know, um, My brothers like to make a joke of everything. And that's great. It's hilarious in almost every circumstance, but some of those jokes I found hurtful. That wasn't their fault. It was how they were coping with their little sister being really poorly. Um, my partner, who took care of me, did the majority of the work. It was absolutely amazing. But in order to get through the really hard bits, he had to emotionally withdraw from me. And that was excruciating, but it had to be done. You, ha you have to understand this. You have to, you have to empathize. Be better than your worst circumstance. Shit happens. Shit is always going to happen. And life doesn't work in the way as if it will wait for when you're ready for shit to happen. It will drop it on you when you're least capable and most vulnerable and least expecting it. Um, what you have to remember is that your life can't fall apart without you. Uh, there's a certain point where the control comes back to you. And... It's up to you whether you fall or fly from that point. Um, this is my granddad. Um, we lost him 
about a year and a half ago. It's only after he died that I realised how much he'd instilled in me. I mean, when I was when I was little, he would come round for his evening cup of tea with my nan, and he'd have bought me a yo-yo or a tamagotchi or something that cost a couple of pounds, and he'd let me know he had it for me, um, but I couldn't have it until I'd proved that I'd earned it. And this could be being on my best behaviour, or speaking nicely, or doing my homework right. It never really gave me an exact thing of what I had to do to get it. So in the end, it just became a habit of putting the best version of myself forward, always trying my absolute best. Because then I've earned whatever I, whatever I want, I'll have earned it. And so, in a part of my brain, when I got ill, I knew that if I just kept getting up, if I just kept smiling, if I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, I will have earned my recovery. It will come because I've earned it. I love this, I love this quote. Um, because it literally sums up my life. I, at one point, I was so determined to be independent that I would bum shuffle across the floor because I couldn't walk. So like, like toddlers do, shuffle along on their bum. You just have to keep going. You have to keep moving forward. Know your base of self. Um, this, this is um, when we're scared or in pain, our psyches take us back to the more primal part of ourselves. And it's, it's not the pretty stuff, it's the stuff that is formed when we're really young and maybe the stuff we like to repress to appear more civilised on a daily basis. Um, but it's the stuff that, I, when we're full in adrenaline mode, it's going to take, take us to that place. Um, but adrenaline's a funny thing. It's, it helps us survive, but it's only supposed to last for about 30 seconds, that flood of adrenaline. And when you're scared or when you're in pain, and it doesn't last 30 seconds, it lasts eight years. You're basically locked in that room of, of your base of self. So this, this, is my, this is my base of self. Um, and like I say, not, not, none of us like our base of selves. <laughs> um, and for a, for a long time, I tried to ignore all this stuff, so I was, I was getting myself into trouble because I refused to let the illness beat me. I refused to let it dictate to me what I could and couldn't do. And so I push and push and push against it until it kicked my ass ten times as hard and I'd end up further back than when I started. And believe it or not, it took me a while to learn that however hard I kicked, I was kicking myself. I wasn't kicking anybody else. Um, and it, it took until my granddad was in hospital and it became clear that he, he wasn't going to come home. And he started crying. And this is, this is like the strongest, most steadfast and solid man I'd ever known. And he was crying, crying his eyes out because he thought he was going to hell. And he wouldn't tell us why. And it took us two days to get it out of him why he thought he was going to hell. And it was because he married my nan, who wasn't Catholic. The, the woman he was married to for 52 years had two kids, about, I think it was about 14 grandkids, great grandkids, and was by her side in their house when she died, holding her hand. This woman, that lifelong love, he thought he deserved to go to hell for that because the Bible says so. And it struck me then that how much of ourselves do we waste and how much of our lives do we waste ripping ourselves apart over stuff nobody else in the world would blame us for? When in my list of my basic cells, it says I'm very self-critical, and I, I, I don't say that lightly. Um, I'm really, really, really hard on myself, which is one of the reasons I got myself into the mess to begin with and I think when I can no matter how hard I, I was trying to get better 
I, it, was never, it was never ever right and I could never let that go. And I hated myself, I hated myself. I hated how weak I was and that I was dependent on everybody else and I was a burden, I was draining the life out of my family. And that's, seeing my, seeing my granddad in that state is, is, is when I learned that maybe it's okay to, to be a bit kind to yourself from time to time. Because that, that base of self, that stuff we don't particularly like about ourselves, by ignoring that, we're also denying ourselves the tools we need to get ourselves out of certain situations. I would never have got through this if I wasn't so stubborn, and if I wasn't a perfectionist, and if I wasn't driven. Don't be too proud to redefine your definition of success. I think speaking to a lot of people with ME, the problem is, is they constantly refer to their old life, who they were before they got ill, and they compare what they can do now as a ME sufferer to what they could do then as an able-bodied person. And it's not, it's not the same thing. You can't, you can't go back, um, but you can build a new life in order to do that and to be content in the new life. You've got to let the old one go. And to do this in the very beginning, you've got to take pride in the little things, and the little things are getting out of bed, and they're having a shower, and they're doing the washing, I mean, you can look at your day and think, I only got the washing done today, but you can look at your day and think, Christ, I was in that much pain, but I got out of bed and I got that load of washing done. It's, the, it's those little things. I think in, in business and watching a lot of do talks, we talk about iteration and pivoting and adapting. And we know we can apply that to business and products, but we forget that we can apply that to ourselves. And aside from our base of cells, which are stuck as they are, Everything else is open to adaptation. You know, we can grow and we can learn and we can improve and we can create new versions of ourselves. Positive mental attitude. I'm not going to lie, I effing hated this. At the, oh, at the beginning, every time someone would like crouch down and really condescendingly go, well, remember Steph, positive mental attitude, I wanted to punch them in the face really hard with a chair. Um, and I would have if I could only move my arm. Um, I think it, I reached a point where the insinuation that I wasn't, I took, there's no such thing as can't to mean you think I don't think I'm trying hard enough when I'm trying my absolute best. And that's because I was sensitive because I was living with an illness that is surrounded by the insinuation that it's all in your head. So I didn't like thinking that how I thought about things was affecting my physical self. Um, but the thing with there's no such thing as can't, because there is such a thing as can't. It's a perfectly acceptable condition for a lot of people. A paraplegic can't walk, that's okay. But it's different admitting to yourself what's doable um, to telling yourself you can't do something. The two are very, very different things. Um, because how we think can affect our physical selves, because it can affect how we make decisions. And it was only when I got sent to um, a clinic up north, um, run by Dr. Williams, um, when he, he sat me down and he said, what do you consider the end point of your illness to be? What do you consider yourself recovered? And I hadn't thought about it, hadn't dared think about it, because looking forward was too dangerous because it was all the more disappointing when you relapsed. And um, it was only then that I started to think, what, what do I, what, when will I think of myself as recovered? And positive mental attitude it is a thing people say, how did you get better? It's because I genuinely decided I was going to. I started to dare to dream. I made aims which I hadn't let myself do before. It's not really about thinking positively, it's about weeding out the knee-jerk negativity and the fear. And you have to train yourself to accept positive possibility. <coughs> These are my 2014 names for this year. Um, beat painkiller free, as I said, I was on 25 painkillers a day. Um, I am now on zero. Um, beyond disabled, I was fully disabled with the blue badge and all that jazz, the blue badge went back in January. Um, learned to drive, my driving test is booked for about two weeks time. Um, take up running, I run three times a week, interval training, 
Um, oh, take a photo a day, that's the only thing I've let myself. But I think all things considered, I can add, uh, do a do talk. And uh, I think that's, that's a fair exchange. The imagination. I think looking back, the reason I kept my sanity for the most part was because I'm a daydreamer. I mean, Emmy is a, is a lonely illness emotionally because people can sympathize with you. Um, but you have to go through the pain and you have to learn how to deal with it. They, they can't do that for you. And um, just a note, it's, I mean, it's hard watching people go through that. And my advice would be, if you don't know what to do, hold their hand. That's all you ever need to do for someone is hold their hand. Um, and it's lonely physically because people have got to work, you know, they've got lives, they can't sit with you constantly. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable, but it, it looks like this. Um, that's a large portion of my life. Uh, so we've got a cat, we've got two cats, and they kept me company. Um, no matter how broken our body is, the imagination can't be, can't be touched. And whenever it got too much, I'd crawl inside my head and I was stuck in my body, but my imagination was a no bad. No bad? No mad. It, uh, it went everywhere. I travelled everywhere. And that's what got me through. Be careful how you spend your energy. Um, David wrote a piece on the time bank and I loved it. Um, but in, in my head, I thought, time isn't... I don't consider time to be the most important thing in my day. Really, you can always squeeze a bit more time. You can eat at your desk. You can sleep a bit less. Um, my most important factor is my energy because we don't have a handy little gadget that tells us how much we've got left or how much a task is going to take up of it. Uh, we can't ration it. We can't portion it. We can't decide what task deserves it more than others. Um, so I had to create a shortcut in my brain. Is this worth my energy? Be a warrior. Recently started yoga, like really recently, like three weeks. And then my favorite pose is the, is the warrior pose. Um, because when we think of a warrior, we think of a fighter, I think. But this is not an attacking posture. It's not a defensive posture. The arms are open, you know. And I will never, I will never be the strongest person. I will, although I consider myself recovered, I think of Emmy as sort of like a wild dog. Uh, at first, I didn't know it, I didn't understand it, and it kept taking chunks out of me. So I'd sort of try and kick it, and it'd take more chunks out of me. And then, at this point, I've got it sitting nicely with a collar on and a lead. And it does as it's told, for the most part. But if I take my eyes off it, it's still got teeth and it's still got claws. You know, I'll, I will never be the strongest, but I can be this warrior. I can love as much and as openly as I'm capable and I can be enthusiastic about almost absolutely everything. And I can live through life with my arms open, embracing it exactly as it comes, warts and all. And I think